click Submit, and there it is, Hello Rob. It's definitely a poor man's user interface in that we're just triggering this browser-dependent screen. Chrome even gives its own logo here. So there's other ways of doing this, but clearly we've dynamically gotten some data from that DOM element. But hopefully we can do a bit better. So let me actually roll back, not to zero, but to DOM1.html. The form is going to be the same, but let's instead introduce a slightly different approach here. So in this version, what appears to be different at first glance, even if you can't read all of the lines in question? I moved the script. I moved the script down below. All right, why did I do that? Or what's the effect of this? There's a few things different here. Well, let's take a look. So one, it's an important detail that the form is now coming before the script. Because one of the conclusions we reached earlier is that JavaScript's reading of a page, or the browser's parsing of a page is synchronous. It does things one at a time, at a time, at a time. So in fact, as a, as a tangent, if you've ever used Google Analytics or you use like the Facebook Like button, actually Google Analytics specifically tells you to put their code where? Sorry? at the end, right above the close body tag. Why? Well, just in case Google servers are slow or the user has a slow connection to Google but not to you, Google doesn't want to be responsible for slowing down the loading of your web page lest the user see nothing until Google also loads its JavaScript cookie tracking code at the bottom. Now, the last time I looked, Facebook tells you to put their code where? Okay, right after the open body tag, thereby giving it more priority. But in their defense, the way Google uh, loads code into your page is they actually retroactively go back and inject it into the top of the page so it's not actually a blocking call. So different subtleties that we'll um, not spend time on here, but that's the motivation for those different design decisions is how will the page's loading be affected. So let's see what the relevance here is. Here's my form. I've this time given it an ID of demo so that I can uniquely identify the form element itself. I have the same input and submit button as before. And then down here I have a script. But notice my code has changed a little bit. What's the first syntactic difference that you see this time that wasn't here before? Yeah? OK, good. So notice that return false is below the HTML itself. It's not inside of the HTML. In fact, there's no on submit attribute anymore. Instead, we seem to be manipulating a property called on submit. So again, to the object-oriented nature of JavaScript, it turns out that just as there's this global document object, inside of which is a method called get element by ID, that in turn is going to return the element whose ID is demo. And which element is that? What type of element? It's a form. It turns out that form elements have a property called on submit. And this is not a property whose value is supposed to be a number or a string. It's supposed to be a function pointer, so to speak, a reference to a function, the address of a function. Think of it however you'd like based on what language you have as a background. So on submit equals, what does this mean? Notice that on the right hand side here, there's the keyword function again, open paren, close paren. But what is absent this time from the function declaration? There's no name of this function. But it doesn't matter, right? Because what I'm actually doing here is clearly creating what seems to be an anonymous function. It's a function with no name, otherwise known as a lambda function. And when you call the function keyword in this way, notice I have the open curly brace, then some stuff, then close curly brace, semicolon. So I've declared in these few lines of code an anonymous function, but because I have an equal sign right before it, I'm essentially storing the address of that function, a pointer there too, or a reference to that function where as the value of this on submit property. The browser has been defined, meanwhile, to know if this on submit property, previously null, is set to a valid reference of a function when the form is actually submitted by the user by clicking submit or hitting enter on a physical keyboard, find this value call that function and return true or false based on what it tells you to do. So clearly it's returning false. What else is it doing? It's also doing the alert, but the alert thing is the same as before. So what have we done? We've removed the on submit attribute from the HTML, replaced it instead with pure JavaScript code. Why? What's an argument in favor of this approach? OK, 
OK, good. So just in case we're using a browser that has some incompatibilities, by moving the code outside of the context of the form, the script is, less, is more likely to be ignored. And indeed, that should be the case. Even browsers that have JavaScript off should just ignore the contents of this tag. So it's not a bad thought. In reality, I don't think it would end up being a problem, because if the browser just doesn't support JavaScript, the fact that we had on submit equals quote unquote something should also be ignored in the same way. But not a bad approach, yeah? Similar to the script, though, we extract a model from the view. Good. So we'll come back to the jargon um, of MVC um, probably in a week or two. But for now, let's summarize it as my code was getting a little sloppy. Not only did I have HTML and then also some CSS in that file up above in previous examples, now I'm putting actual logic, programming code, inside of my markup language, whose name suggests it should be for markup, making things bold, making things centered, structure, uh, structuring a page. should have nothing to do fundamentally with code. So in the interest of keeping my coding life separate from my markup life, this is generally a better approach. It's not perfect, because frankly, it's like, half a foot away from where it was before. So we haven't really solved this problem. But keeping code separate from logic and presentation is a key theme that we'll come back to because it permeates the iOS SDK and the environment for writing iPhone apps. But this is at least a step toward that. And also, if we're only calling this function on submit, we definitely don't need to give it a name. I, if I'm the only person ever calling this code, I called it greet before, but I didn't even really need that name because clearly I can do without it entirely. Ah, uh, good question. In JavaScript, none. Um, I'm in the habit lately of using all single quotes for JavaScript and all double quotes for HTML, but there's functionally no difference in JavaScript. He's referring to the single quotes I had around demo, for instance. This would be a matter of style, too. For the projects, if you have a religion about single and double quoting, that's fine. Just be self-consistent with respect to your own code. All right, so now let me go into this file. And let's see, I'll use the simplest of programs on Mac OS, text edit. And I'm going to go into, remember, John Harvard's uh, sites folder, which is where we put this code. I'm going to go into source 0, go into JavaScript, and go into dom1.html. So here is that web page, but now it's in an editable program. I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to do things the opposite. I'm going to delete the script tag, and I'm going to put it above the form. And then I'm going to save the file. I'm going to go back to my browser. I'm going to reload the page. So indeed, the browser now sees the change I made in text edit. In text edit. I'm going to go back to the page itself and reload this. So the form has been reloaded on the page. And now I'm going to go ahead and type in Rob again and submit. And it seems to have broken. In fact, I see a question mark in the URL, which usually means a form has physically been submitted to a server, which I did not intend. There was supposed to be a return false. So let me start diagnosing things. So when doing the first project in the course, um, much as uh, Apple likes Safari, using Chrome is probably the better browser to use from a development perspective because it has additional features, one of which is this inspector element at the bottom, which Safari has its own variant of. Um, but I think you'll find that Chrome is useful both for mobile and desktop development. And I'm going to go into the console window here for a moment. And that's interesting. The red text, which if I zoom in, says uncaught type error cannot set property on submit of null. So that's kind of a mouthful. I didn't really understand the first half. But on submit looks familiar, and null sounds worrisome. So let's see where in my code I use the keyword on submit. So here's my code. On submit can't call this with respect to null. So again, the error was cannot set property on submit of null. So what does this suggest is null? The no demo. Specifically, the return value of the method get element by ID when passed an argument of quote unquote demo is apparently now returning not a rectangle, but null. And null is the null object. It has no properties, certainly not one called on submit, which is why Chrome is freaking out and not doing anything. And in fact, Chrome and most browsers approach when there's a JavaScript error is just to forge ahead blindly. In this case, it submitted the form, irrespective of my return false. Why is all of a sudden the demo element null? Exactly. It's because the browser is parsing this code top to bottom, left to right. And at the, this point in the story, when I'm reading the script tag in its new location, I can call get element of, by ID of quote unquote demo all I want. It won't exist until 
we get down there. But I'm calling this line of code here, which is why, sort of、um, coincidentally, my code worked fine before, even though I put my script tag、um, still in the file. Up below. But this too, in the spirit of keeping my code separate from my HTML, feels a little hackish to just solve all of my JavaScript problems by putting my code at the very bottom of my files. Hopefully, there's a better way than that. And there is, if we scroll back to our demos here, and let me go into the last version of DOM, DOM2, which hopefully works. Hello, Rob, in fact, works. Let's take a look at this code here and see what's different. All right, my HTML seems to have been vastly simplified, and I'm now practicing what I've been preaching about not、uh, commingling code with my raw markup. In fairness, I've just moved it up to the top, but at least now it's inside of the head element, which at least is sort of conceptually distinct from the body, which is where the actual aesthetics of my page should be. And frankly, at this point, we could rip out this code and put it where? In a separate file called like file.js, like I suggested earlier. So we're almost there, but we'll just leave it with this example. But now I see some scary looking syntax and also one new script tag. What are we apparently loading into memory here? Yeah, jQuery. So, jQuery is a super, super popular library for JavaScript. So popular that many people confuse JavaScript with jQuery itself and they say, I know jQuery, when really they know JavaScript and they also know jQuery, but they're not alternatives to one another. What jQuery does is it allows you to dramatically simplify the amount and the complexity of code that you need to write because some very smart people,、um, one in particular,、um, has spent a number of years now building up a corpus of code that just makes everyone's life easier. And it's all open source. You can read through it. It's thousands of lines long. But for our purposes, let's just focus on some of the highlights and some of the features that we'll see commonly throughout any library you might use for this first project or really desktop development in general. So there turns out there's a dollar sign, which is a popular aspect of jQuery. What does the dollar sign represent in jQuery? What special significance does? The dollar sign have in JavaScript? It's a selector. So it is, but let's focus not so much on its functionality, but just syntactically. What, is it syntactic? Sure.、Uh, it kind of is, but it's not even, I'm not even sure I'd call it that. It is just a valid symbol for a variable. So, whereas in some languages, dollar sign has special meaning, like in PHP, it demarks an actual variable's beginning, or in some languages, you just can't use it.、Uh, you can't have a dollar sign in a variable's name. JavaScript doesn't care. You can absolutely have a dollar sign as the name of your variable. Now, jQuery, the folks who wrote it, just realized, oh, this would be kind of sexy if we just started using dollar sign to represent our class called jQuery. But what this really is, is if I go into my code, And this is again DOM2.html. For those who've been using jQuery for some time and just taking it for granted, this is equivalent to that. There is a, we'll call it a class, even though it's not quite a class, called jQuery. And it takes an argument, and that argument can be a CSS selector. In this case, it's the actual name of a global variable document, but that's all it is. So it's not quite syntactic sugar in that it has no fundamental special significance. We humans just view it as something special. All right.、So More properly, jQuery is a function. And there's a hell of a lot of functionality built into that one particular function. And among the things it does, and let's go back to the common case of having dollar signs, is it wraps traditional DOM nodes. So all of those rectangles we've been talking about, jQuery wraps them in the sense of making them a little wider and a little taller and adding more properties and more methods to them. On the end of the day, inside of it is still the original rectangle, but they've simplified the means by which you can talk to that. Rectangle from the tree. So, dollar sign, open paren, close paren, document takes that document node from the top of the tree and just gives it more functionality, more power, if you will. Dot ready is a shorthand way of saying no matter how big this web page is, no matter how many lines of HTML there are, only call the following function when the entire page has been loaded top to bottom, left to right. So, what this means is that this line of code can now be anywhere. In our page, in the head, in the body, in another file, it doesn't matter whatsoever. That means wait until the entirety of the page is literally ready. So, what am I passing to the ready method? So, the ready method expects an argument whose data type is apparently a function pointer, so to speak. It expects a function as its argument. 
And now what am I doing? It's an anonymous function, 